Okay, today we're looking at uh, John Searle's uh, cluster theory of meaning for proper names. Um, and uh, the, the thing about this theory, this cluster theory for proper names, is it raises very sharply, uh, and it's, it raises in a very simple, um, exact way, questions about the relation between language as a property of an individual speaker and language as a property of a community. Um, at the end today, I'll try and bring out how this issue connects up to these problems about informative identities that we were looking at. These are really hard problems about informative identities, and the more you think about them, the deeper they seem. They still um, are not sorted out today. Um, but let's start out with this question about language as the property of a society versus language as something to do with the individual. When you watch a child learning language, it's very natural to think uh, what's going on here is that the child is taking on board something that exists antecedently to it. What the child is doing is taking on board something that's a joint social construction, the, the product of many generations of work, and the way the child takes on board that language is what's giving it um, the capacity to think at all. You only have your capacity to think at all because you've taken on board some of the shared language. That's what thinking is. So it's essentially an individual participating in a collective enterprise. Um, a bit like um, having an economy and having money. It's not as if each of us can individually have money and then we kind of think, well, wouldn't it be good to get together and um, swap our money and things around? Money is essentially something social unless you have a society um, you, you, that all is, are using money. You, you can't do it. You can't do money on your own. Robinson Crusoe on a desert island has no use for money. You can't have money. It makes no sense. Um, and it's natural to think language is like that. You come to have a mind only by taking on board some portion of the shared language. And if you think of it like that, then thought is the interiorization of language. Thought is just what you do when you take on board a bit of this ongoing social institution. I mean, of course, you can juggle with your thoughts in private without letting anyone know what's going on. And similarly, you can juggle with your money in private without letting anyone else know what's going on. But <laughs> you might not tell anyone about your tax returns, for example. Um, but um, still in all, what you're doing there is doing something private, non-viewable, that is essentially involving some public uh, commodity. Um, Alternatively, though, and that's, although I say that's a natural and very powerful perspective to have on language, is not actually the standard view in cognitive science and linguistics today. An alternative and um, natural view is that you should think, also a natural view, is that you should think of language as essentially an individual matter. After all, when you think, what are the drivers of language? Well, it's got to be the individual brains. I mean, each individual brain has to be playing its role in driving the social construct of language. So each of us has on their own to, to have their own individual grasp of the language. You and I can understand the language in different ways. If you come from somewhere different to where I do, your language may be quite different. Um, and maybe more or less different, and we may have to negotiate a bit, or by this you mean that, um, maybe we have to talk around a bit what we mean by individual words. And then when you think of it like that, the shared language, the language that, say, all English speakers have in common, from New Zealand to um, uh, Scotland, um, uh, that's really just a matter of overlapping individual ways of talking. There isn't really a prior construct there. Well, all that happens is that we aim to have reasonable conformity with each other in the way we talk. Um, an extreme version of this view was given by Lewis Carroll in uh, Alice in Wonderland. Uh, when I, is that Alice in Wonderland or Alice in the Looking Glass? Good? <laughs> well, okay, um, I will look up the reference. Um, when I use a word Humpty Dumpty said in a rather... It's, it's through the looking glass. Um, when I use a word Humpty Dumpty said in a rather scornful tone, it means just what I use it to mean, neither more nor less. You get to decide what your words mean. The question is, said Alice, whether you can make words mean so many different things. Uh, and Humpty Dumpty replied, the question is, which is to be master? And that's all. And that's really a basic question. Um, can you really have an individual authority over the meanings of all the words you use? There's one perspective in which you do. Uh, it's only that for practical purposes it's useful to bring that into line with what everybody else says. On the other hand, the alternative perspective is you no more have authority over what all the individual words you use mean than you do over what the individual pieces of money you use are worth. That's not in your own individual control. Um, you just have to go along with what everyone else in society uh, is doing on that. Okay. Now, where Frege stands in this issue is kind of interesting and difficult to pin down. Frege says, on the face of it, Frege spends a lot of time emphasizing the objectivity, the communicability of language. So he's really separating language from anything to do with ideas of the stream of its individual experience, as we were talking about last time. Here. Sorry about that. Someone should actually just this. Well. <laughs> Sorry? Uh. Okay. <laughs> okay. Cautious. Okay. 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 I think my phone is Well, we'll try it. Okay. Um, the sign sense may be the common property of many and therefore is not a part or mode of the individual mind. That's very good. But one can hardly deny that mankind has a common store of thoughts which is transmitted from one generation to another. Okay, that looks like he's stating um, a version of a strong social view of language. What he's talking about when he's talking about sense and informativeness, well, at first sight, you might think, this notion of sense, your way of being given the object, your take on the object, um, that's going to be one-sided and dependent on the standpoint of observation. But Frigg is still saying there's a sense in which that's objective. Although it's a perspective on the object, it's a perspective that can, in principle, be occupied by anyone. Um, like uh, that uh, analogy of the telescope with the object glass in the middle of the telescope, which is giving you just one perspective on the object, there's still is a perspective that anyone can use. Still, then when you look in detail what he says about the sense of a name like Aristotle, um, in the case of an actual proper name, such as Aristotle, opinions as to the sense might be different, might differ. So you might associate a different sense with the term than I do. The sense might, for example, be taken to be the people of Plato and teacher of Alexander the Great. And anybody who does this, so this is still Frege, will attach another sense to the sentence, Aristotle was born in Stagira, then will a man who takes the sense of the name, the teacher of, the Alexa, or teacher of Alexander the Great, who was born in Stagira. So now it looks as if each of us is individually assigning senses to the name. 
So we're each, how should I say, breathing life into the system of signs on our own. It's just that there is this practical responsibility on us to bring uh, our uses of language into alignment with one another. And then there's that remark I quoted last time. So long as the reference remains the same, such variations of sense, sense may be tolerated, although they have to be avoided in the theoretical structure of a demonstrative science and ought not to occur in a perfect, <laughs> perfect language. Well, okay. And how deep a commitment is there here, really, to the social character of language? It looks like he's just saying we should each just bring our individual languages into line with one another. I mean, it's not clear what perfect means. I mean, perfect looks like it just means, um, well, it will maximize communication, something like that, Ma minimize the, difficult, the danger of misunderstanding one another. If that's all it means, then he doesn't actually have any deep commitment to the social character of language. He just wants us to bring, to bring our individual languages into line with one another. OK, so that's the background issue here. Is language essentially social, or is language essentially individual, and there are just practical advantages to bring our individual idiolects into line with one another? Do you have any immediate hunches on that? Okay. Okay. Um, well, Cell, on the face of it, takes quite a strong line in this. Cell says, all right, let's suppose that names are associated with descriptions. Let's suppose that it's right to say that a name like Aristotle or Bill Clinton or um, Mitt Romney is associated with a description. Who does the associating? Who does the lifting here? Who ties up the name to the description? Is it something you do as an individual or is it something you do only as a society? Frege seems to be suggesting it's something done by the individual. Frege is, uh, Cell's getting up front. Frege seems to be saying it's something done by the individual. You look at Cell, he's saying quite clearly it's something done by society. Craig is saying, in a perfect language, each of us is going to have associated with each name exactly one description, and it'll be the same for everyone. But if you do it like that, if that's the right picture of what's going on, then why would you bother having names at all? Why not just use descriptions? Um, there's one single over there. Uh, is that what right in the comment? I mean, if, if all you're going to do in a perfect language is for each description you have, tie it up to a name, then there doesn't seem to be any need for names. I mean, it would be better just to use the descriptions. And admittedly, some descriptions might be a bit long, so you might have a, a, a name as a short form. But that would be it. There would be no more basic distinction between names and descriptions than that. This is not how Cyril proceeds. Cyril says, suppose we ask users of the name Aristotle to say what they regard as certain essential and established facts about him. Their answers would be a set of uniquely referring descriptive statements. So you're looking at what the users, plural, are doing here. And that's how you get the cluster of descriptions associated with Aristotle. I mean, you might not ask just anyone. You might say, well, let's ask regular people. But you might think, well, there's some special way it goes in what experts say about who the name Aristotle is, 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 what descriptions you associate with the name Aristotle. I mean, most of us would say, well, I don't know that much about Aristotle. You should ask, really ask someone in classics. Um, that's what you'll find out. And with most names, you might say, well, really, I, I know a little bit about Mitt Romney, but for a full description, you should really ask some uh, politics, don't you? Um, with most names, you'd want to um, say, everyone in the community gets a vote, but not all votes are equal as to, who this name, as, as to what descriptions you associate with the name. And Cell says, however exactly this goes, you draw on the whole community in giving due weight to the fact that some people are regarded as experts. And uh, you get that cluster of description associated with the name from the whole community. And that's what fixes the reference of the name. So there might be some room for negotiation here, some indeterminacy about which descriptions are in this cluster. If you say, uh, if some people say, well, Aristotle was Roman, um, should that go in? You know, do you just say, well, what do they know? Um, uh, they get outvoted by everyone else. There might be some um, indeterminacy as to who you call an expert, who you count as an expert in Mitt Romney, for example. And how many of those descriptions an object has to match? I mean, could it turn out that Aristotle was, after all, Roman? Um, it's just that we, 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 we'd all along be making a mistake as to when he lived. Or would that show that there was no such person as Aristotle? I mean, it might not be quite definite uh, which way it goes. But anyway, what's going on is that if you want to understand how the name works, what you do is a social exercise. You draw on what everyone in the society thinks, and you get your bag, your dossier of descriptions from that. And the point of this, Cell says, this is why it's when you realize what's going on with names is that each name is being associated in the society with a kind of loose bag of descriptions, and no one individual is authoritative as to which descriptions are in the bag. It's when you understand that that's what's going on that you see why we have names at all. Um, names are not functioning as descriptions. They are loose pegs on which you hang descriptions. You have your big loose bag of descriptions drawn from everyone in the society. No one individual needs to know all of them. But what we do is we peg that with a single name, the same for everyone. So that looseness of the criteria for proper names. That looseness in which descriptions are in the bag is actually what makes names such a good thing. It's what makes names so valuable to our use of language. It means that you just don't have to have decided right at the start, well, is Aristotle definitely Greek or could it turn out that he was Roman? Um, that's what isolates the referring function from the describing function of language. If you uh, describe someone as a Greek, well, to meet that description, they have to be Greek. Um, just describing someone as Aristotle doesn't give you any commitment like that. So this is a way, this is a very simple way in which in your individual use of language, you can be essentially drawing on the resources of the whole society. This is a very simple example of the kind of view that says the social language comes first and the individual mind just takes advantage of what is going on in that whole uh, group. On a view like this, Humpty Dumpty is just wrong. You don't get to decide for yourself what the name Aristotle stands for. In understanding the name Aristotle, the, the, the whole way a name works is as a peg for a socially generated dossier of descriptions to be associated with it. Here's Cell again. The uniqueness and immense pragmatic convenience of proper names in our language lies precisely in the fact that they enable us to refer publicly to objects. That was two, I think I just typed. Basically. Lies precisely in the fact that they enable us to refer publicly to objects without being forced to raise issues and come to agreement on what descriptive characteristics exactly constitute the identity of the object. I'm a hardline Republican. I associate a quite different set of descriptions with the name Mitt Romney than um, 
as someone who's a hardline Democrat, this is fine. It doesn't really matter that we individually associate different descriptions with the name. Um, what the, the great thing is, is that the society is generating the same bag of descriptions across the society, and each of us can just tag that bag of descriptions with the same name. Okay. So that's Celsius. That's a cluster theory. Yes? Are the descriptions completely arbitrary, or is there some public agreement with what they are? Uh, if individuals, oh, I see, if each individual just arbitrarily attaches a whole bunch of descriptions to a name, then it should not be public. Yeah, um, I think that's right. I mean, it would be very weird if um, you, yeah, you, you associate your descriptions with the name wrongly, I associate my descriptions with the name wrongly, and gee whiz, it turns out that there's some congruence between them. Yeah, yeah. There must be more to it than that. There's something bringing us into harmony. Um, what about this kind of picture? Um, each of us, as we go through life, if you just take names of people uh, to start out with, each of us, as we go through life, is radiating information about ourselves into the community. Some of us generate more than others, but most of us, <laughs> I mean, if you're well known enough to have a name, then you must have generated a little bit of interest, you must have generated a little bit of information into the community. So you might think of the descriptions you're getting as the product of that kind of information generation by a single individual. I mean, presumably that's what actually goes on. That's my main point today, how this ties into informativeness. But just not to make a mystery of what I'll tell you right now, what my main point is, is that informativeness seems to be an individual matter. Yeah. So if you take uh, as basic this social use of language, it's actually very difficult to see what characterization you can give of this distinction between informative and uninformative identities. Um, because informative versus uninformativeness, that's not a distinction that's drawn at the level of the society. That's drawn at the level of the individual. Um, but how then? Uh, well, the point was, if you've got an uninformative identity, the, the point I was making, I can't remember if it was last time or the time before last, was if you have an uninformative identity, if sameness of sense is enough to guarantee sameness of reference, then the sense that the individual is grasping must be enough to guarantee sameness of reference. But in this social picture, um, how can that be? Because nothing at the level of the individual is what fixes reference at all. Reference is being fixed at the level of society. Is that addressing question? Yeah. Yeah. I'll try and say more about that. Mm -hmm. Can different individuals get the same sense of the same name? Yeah. yeah. We're actually going to spend a little time on questions in just that area uh, uh, today and next week. Uh, today and Monday. Today and Wednesday. Um, assuming today is Monday. Um, sorry, some questions I don't get answered because someone wants to share about it. <laughs> um, but, oh, well, yeah, yeah, well. Yeah, yeah I, I, you know, he didn't put it quite like that, of course. I mean, this is 1959 or something. Right? Um, but uh, that's actually not a bad way of putting it. That if you want to know the, the cluster of descriptions associated with a name, Wikipedia would not be a bad place to start. I mean, you wouldn't want to stop there, of course, because Wikipedia can be hijacked. Can it? Right? Okay. Let's check it out. Okay. Um, so it's not that exactly that Wikipedia is definitive, but um, it ca that catches the spirit of the idea. The sense of something at the level of Wikipedia. And of course, the whole thing about Wikipedia is the whole is greater than any of the parts. Yeah, the, the whole idea is that no one user is a part of the other. What's the interest? Yeah. That's what's catching. That's what's catching. Okay. okay. Well, one thing that's great about Sal's approach is whenever you get a proper name, if you, if you suppose, let me just stick with that example of Mitt Romney. If you say Mitt Romney, um, tell me something about Mitt Romney. I don't, I don't wish to be making political remarks. I hope I might, but I won't be using all the names. Mid Romney said corporations are people. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm here. Okay, so Mid Romney said corporations are people. Now the thing is, that might well be a description, one of the descriptions that helps fix the reference of the term. That might be one of the descriptions we associate with the name. But it's not a priori that Mid Romney said that corporations are people. You don't know that just by knowing the, by understanding the name, and it might turn out not to be true. Yeah, I mean it might turn out that's just not so at all. Yeah, I mean I don't mean to undervalue your credibility, <laughs> but uh, that, that could happen. You can make sense of that finding out that it was some A who said it and the remark was um, mistakenly attributed to him. And that really could, in principle, happen for any description you associate with the name. He might turn out never to have really re registered as a Republican. Yeah, I mean, of course, this kind of stuff gets a little bit implausible, but it's not a priori false. It's not like saying 2 plus 2 is 5. Um, so any description that you associate with the name, it might turn out that that description did not apply to the thing you were talking about. I mean, intuitively, it feels like the name just tags the object. The name doesn't say anything about the object. The name's just a tag for that thing. So any description material that you um, associate with the object, it might turn out that, the, that that's not true of the object. Um, whereas in Frege's picture, if you associate with the name Aristotle, the sense, the teacher of Alexander the Great who was born in Stagira, then you can't be wrong about that. That's a priori.